Good evening. My name is Jacob Park, and I'm the director of BSR's Sustainable Futures Lab. As Aaron mentioned, BSR launched the Futures Lab last year in order to bring strategic foresight, also known as futures thinking, to our members. Motivating this was the recognition that in a world characterized by rapid, nonlinear change, new tools are needed to help business chart the right course forward. Futures thinking isn't about making predictions. It's about making more effective choices amidst highly uncertain future possibilities, coming to grips with the implications of profound change, and reimagining how we do things. Over the past year, I've had the pleasure of working with a number of you on futures projects in industries ranging from healthcare to aviation to energy. And the one comment that I've heard in the course of every engagement is, we haven't been taking the time to do this as an organization, and we need to do so more often. Reflecting this, in 2019, the lab will be working with other teams within BSR to integrate futures thinking into a broader range of what we offer. Just to mention a few examples, with the sustainability management team, we're using scenarios to augment our work on materiality and resilient strategy. The human rights practice is adding futures thinking to human rights impact assessments to better account for emerging risks and opportunities such as those posed by artificial intelligence. And we're partnering with the climate team to help our members with climate scenario analysis in line with the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. We will also be creating and sharing with you more futures-related content. As part of that, I'm pleased to announce the launch today of our new BSR Scenarios Report, Doing Business in 2030, Four Possible Futures. This is not your typical BSR report. For one thing, there are only eight bullet points in the entire thing, and I counted. <laughs> The design is unusually cool. And the heart of the report is a set of stories, yes, stories, that imagine what the world might look like for sustainable business in the year 2030. Now, normally, of course, a new BSR report would be headline news. This year, however, America scheduled an election the exact same day as the start of our conference, and frankly, it's sucking up a lot of the oxygen in the room. Um, just a shout out to the BSR comms team for your valiant work today. <laughs> it's okay though, because honestly, there could not be a more fitting moment to launch these scenarios than right now. Because tonight, more than ever in our lives, we stand on the fulcrum of history. In just a few short hours, reality is going to fork along one of two very divergent paths. I don't need to tell you how much is hanging in the balance. For the quantum physicists in the room, I'd say that we're currently living in Schrodinger's democracy. But today's election is hardly the only profound pivot point in play. In September, the World Economic Report Forum re released a report on automation. It estimated that by 2022, automation could displace 75 million jobs. On the other hand, the report found that over the same time period, automation could create 133 million new jobs. The key is whether business and society can provide workers with the new skills that they'll need for these jobs. We have four years to do so. On a planetary level, the choices are equally profound. In recent weeks, we've learned that two degrees is not the safe limit we thought it was that accelerated ocean warming has eaten up more of our carbon budget than we realized, and that tipping points in the climate system could push us inexorably into a hothouse state sooner than expected. On the other hand, California, the world's fifth largest economy, recently declared its ambition to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. Coca-Cola, Mars, and other BSR members recently joined with BSR to launch the Climate Resilient Value Chain's Leaders Platform to accelerate action on climate resilience in supply chains. And investors, not known for hippy-dippy thinking, are now asking businesses to report on their plans for the transition to a low-carbon economy. 
So the uncertainty is high and the stakes are even higher. It's no exaggeration to say that the actions we take over the next decade will determine the future of humanity and the planet. And those actions will largely be dictated by the choices we make today, this week, and over the next few years. Figuring out which actions to take to drive business success and deliver sustainability, all while navigating the complexity of disruptive and uncertain change, really does require a different way of thinking. We need to be able to stretch our thinking to consider wildly divergent futures, understand how complex changes interrelate, and discern a wiser course forward. Which brings me back to the scenarios. The scenarios presented in our report are neither predictions nor forecasts. Indeed, they are in some ways an antidote to the endless flood of forecasts that confidently declare what the future will hold and are almost always wrong. Instead, these scenarios are stories designed to stretch our thinking by dramatizing some of the very real but unpredictable possibilities that could remake the world for sustainable business. Combining rigorous research with a healthy dose of creativity, they are what you might get if, say, Green Biz and Black Mirror got together and had a child. <laughs> the creation of these scenarios was shaped by many of you. They were informed by conversations and workshops over the past year in New York, Hong Kong, San Francisco, and elsewhere. During the course of those conversations, we sought to discern some of the key uncertainties that will shape the future of business and sustainability and think with you about how some of these might play out. While the scenarios explore numerous factors reshaping the future, on a high level, they're organized around two big uncertainties. Whether the forces of centralization and consolidation will prevail, or those of decentralization and democratization, and fragmentation. And number two, whether we will stick with the current economic paradigm of endless growth and profit maximization, or shift towards a new paradigm that views the purpose of the economy as providing for equitable prosperity on a healthy planet. Within this framework, we then described four very different futures. In the first of these, a tale of two systems, challenges to the Western model of capitalism eventually drive a shift towards sustainability. At the outset of this story, automation and environmental disruption cause global turmoil. Stepping into the breach, China promotes a vision of prosperity, order, and sustainability that draws emerging economies into its orbit, posing a credible alternative. Eventually, Western government and business leaders realize they need to radically reform the social contract if free market capitalism is to survive, and they start to do so. In this world, not only do all of you keep your jobs, you get a raise too. In another scenario, Tribalism Inc., the road ahead looks a bit more bumpy. In this world, the notion that all business is political has taken hold, and the polarization of today has intensified into profound social, economic, and cultural fragmentation. New tribes emerge with not just different values, but aided by technology, profoundly different experiences of reality. Collective action becomes increasingly difficult and by 2030, some of these tribes are experimenting with geoengineering and other unilateral approaches to global challenges. A third scenario, move slow and fix things, imagines a future that is challenging to global business, but gentler on people and the planet. For fans of Portlandia, this is your scenario. As with a tale of two systems, this story starts with a crisis, a panic about the health effects of plastics, a series of deep fake misinformation scandals during the next election, and a global recession undermine trust in the system. People become disillusioned with consumerism, big business and social media, and a movement to opt out goes mainstream. As more localized economies emerge, people rediscover the benefits of community and a culture of healing starts to take root. Finally, we have total information awareness. I promised you some black mirror, and this scenario delivers. In this future, we've come to depend on AI companions that live in tiny devices in our ears and help us with everything. From learning to organizing information to choosing what we eat, we rely on these companions for almost everything. 
And the results are amazing. Concentrated networks of huge businesses leverage extreme data to provide affordable, effective, and seamless services. Privacy is gone, but diabetes is on the decline. Much work has been automated, but the cost of living has gone down, and people find that they enjoy only working three or four days a week. The summaries I've provided only scratch the surface of what's in these scenarios. I hope you'll all find a moment to read them along with the other information in the report. And over the coming year, I expect that we'll be having lots of conversations with you about the themes explored in the scenarios. To get that process started, we've put together a great panel this evening to discuss some of the issues in more detail. In just a moment, I'll be joined on stage by Kate Brandt, Chief Sustainability Officer at Google, Kyung Ah Park, Head of Environmental Markets at Goldman Sachs, and Eric Olson, Senior Vice President at BSR. So please let us know what you think of these, what resonates, and what big questions are that you're grappling with. Finally, on this momentous evening, I want to leave you with a quote from one of my favorite writers, Arundhati Roy. She said, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you. You can find the scenarios on our website. <laughs> I'm not sure of the URL, sorry. <laughs> OK. Thank you, Jacob. We'll all get settled up here. Have a seat, please. Okay. So we had the idea with, with this session um, of getting some really smart people who have really hard jobs and really specific decisions to make to grapple a little bit with the content we put out. So, so uh, both Kate and uh, uh, Tun Ha have, have had a week, I think, about a week with the scenarios. They got a sneak peek. And we're going to have a conversation about some of the, the, not only some of the specific insights that are in them, but what do you do as, as a busy person in business to take these very big, unusual pictures of what might, what might come to pass and turn it into better decisions now. This is ultimately our challenge. We're not going to solve it in the next 20 minutes on this stage, but we're going to talk about some of the things in it. Um, I should probably say by a little bit more background, uh, each of them, however, so Kate is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Google. I always love to, to point out that before that, she was the, um, the, chief, the first ever Chief Sustainability Officer for the US government. That wasn't big enough, so she moved to Google, which is kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> Kyung Ha, as head of environmental markets at Goldman Sachs, maybe uh, when I ask you your first question, you'll, you'll sort of flesh out some of the things you do. But it's, it's a group that has done a lot of different things. I think your commitment is $150 billion in clean energy finance, mobilizing $150. Financing and investing, yeah. Finance investing. Um, as well as um, leading the, the firm in the creation of a bunch of innovative new vehicles that we'll talk about, because I think they're relevant to, um, to the future we're talking about. <clears throat> and actually, to that end, let me start with you. Um, in the first scenario that, that Jacob described, um, Tale of Two Systems, um, GDP is supplanted by other more holistic measures of value. And that got you and I into an interesting conversation a few days ago. Is that already happening? Is this absurd? Is this a plausible extension of where we are? Say a bit now about what's going on in your group and more broadly in finance. Sure. So first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And it's also fun to sit next to a fellow Park. I'm sure <laughs> if we go way back when, we'll be related. But we're not related directly now. Um, <laughs> But I enjoyed your scenario presentation. So coming to your question about value. Um, so there's a lot actually happening uh, in the real world, both in the public market domain as well as in the private market domain, around integration of value more broadly, um, and also in the public sector. So I'm sure many of you have seen a report by the World Bank that earlier this year uh, took a very comprehensive approach to looking at not just a traditional static GDP of a nation's wealth, but taking a much more dynamic look at an entire nation's assets. 
uh, everything from human capital, your traditional uh, physical, as well as financial capital, as well as human capital. And there are lots of other types of metrics like this. But I think what's more exciting is what's happening in the private markets. And Aaron alluded to as part of his introduction the work that he's doing with KKR and ESG. And talking about ESG, which represents environmental social governance, uh, a lot more of it is getting considered on top of the financial metrics that traditional investors are looking at. So if you look at the broad asset management world out there, and this is a little bit of a data statistic, um, but let me quote it anyway just to give you a sense of the magnitude. There's about 23 trillion, or about a quarter of the profession managed assets that have some form of an ESG strategy. There's a 2016 number, so that number is actually even bigger. Coming back to Goldman, let me give you an example of the growth that we're seeing. So we have an asset management division. In 2015, we acquired a team called Imprint Capital that is de dedicated towards ESG and impact strategies. At that time, uh, we had about $550 million of dedicated ESG and impact assets. Today, three years later, that number is north of $15 billion. And that's in addition to what we call ESG overlays, which is about $75 billion of assets under management. This is exclusionary screens and so on. And as an example of a product that we launched earlier this year, um, we did what's called Just ETF. It's an exchange traded fund. It's in partnership with Just uh, Capital, which is a Paul Tudor Jones Foundation that looks at companies from a much more holistic set of values. So looking again at environmental social governance and looking for just companies. And the companies that perform better on that just metrics when you back test it actually also perform well financially. So effectively proven that you can actually do good and do well. And there are um, many other examples like that in the product domain. But let me also just very briefly pivot to the fact that we're also seeing really interesting financial instruments that are unlocking ability for a capital to actually be more directly flowing into these types of environmental and social opportunities. In the public capital markets, which is incredibly deep and liquid, I'm sure many of you are familiar with green bonds and social bonds, which are very much like any other bonds, but the use of proceeds is directed towards environmentally and socially beneficial purposes. So that's in the capital markets domain. But also in the private domain, again, coming back to what Aaron said in the opening remarks, we're seeing many more private equity firms now looking at dedicated impact funds, as well as a more niche impact investors who are directly investing into things like renewables, healthcare, education, and fintech access, and so on. So there's a lot happening there. Fantastic. So it sounds like, uh, Jacob, sounds like the Chinese have some competition. They just might do it. Hopefully so. Yeah. <laughs> Kate. Um, one of the things that we talked about as we were going through um, this was the fact that the question is, in Aaron's words, planetary boundaries weaves through the scenarios so strongly. Um, and one of the things that I know you spend and your team spend a lot of time on, time on is how to take advantage of some of the newer technologies, whether it be literally AI or AI plus some other things, um, to help power dramatic improvements in terms of our ability to manage within planetary boundaries. How is this next year? Is this 10 years out? What are some of the things you guys are working on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think we're, we're beginning to see and to fully appreciate the power of machine learning and AI, also other technologies, uh, cloud computing, geomapping, to both help us drive even deeper uh, environmental, positive environmental impact, but also to really be able to measure the vital signs of the planet. Um, so to give you a few examples, at Google, we often like to try stuff out on ourselves first. We call this dog food, basically eat your own dog food. Um, so one thing that we have been experimenting with uh, for, many, for several years now is how do we take machine learning, you know, this fairly new technology, which is essentially the ability of an algorithm to ingest a bunch of data, find patterns in that data, and then one use for those patterns can be recommending you know, better solutions. And so we had a team that started as a, a team of one, as a what we call 20% project at Google, just a side project. Um, it's now grown into a program that we're deploying across all of our global data centers. But essentially, uh, what we've done is we've taken a machine learning algorithm and we've said, take a look at our cooling system for our data centers. This is where we use a lot of our energy. And this is a system we've been trying to optimize for 10 years. This is probably one of the most efficient industrial systems you'll find. 
And even so, by applying this machine learning algorithm, the team is seeing a 30% uptick in efficiency. Um, so of course, that's great for us. That's tremendous. And we're working to deploy this more broadly at Google. But also, that really points you to the power of tools like machine learning to drive much deeper efficiency than has ever been possible before. You can also think about, you know, as, as Eric, you were describing, you know, planetary boundaries. How do we measure the vital signs of our planet? How do we begin to get better insights into how we manage our oceans and our fisheries or global surface water or our forests? And so we're also starting to see tremendous opportunities to utilize technology for that. So if you think about uh, at sea, we want to protect our fisheries. Uh, we've partnered with Oceana and SkyTruth, two great NGOs. Uh, and through the power of cloud computing and geomapping and machine learning, we've developed the first ever open source tool that shows all global fishing activity in real time. This has already been used just in the last few years to, protect, to, to create five new marine protected areas. Also at sea, we're looking at how can we utilize machine learning to help better understand animal sounds. So we've partnered up with NOAA, and we're using machine learning to determine where are different whales, and what, you know, where is their pod, and, and ultimately we want to be able to do this for many more species. That can enable scientists and conservationists to better protect life under the sea and on land. Um, we also have been thinking about the, how this relates uh, to our forests. You know, global forest cover is critical to climate change, to keeping our air clean. So equally, we've developed a tool that enables us called Global Forest Watch to track all global forest cover in real time. And again, communities around the world are using this to protect the, their own forests. So I think we're really seeing this tremendous opportunity that we have to utilize technology, to utilize data, to give us better insights, and ultimately to drive much more impactful outcomes on sustainability than have been possible before. Fantastic, really, really interesting stories. So the, um, and of course there's a lot of talk and a lot of people writing about all the issues we need to anticipate as well with the deployment of technologies like these. Um, social ethical implications raised by AI in, in, in areas that we may not have even thought of. And Jacob, uh, you really caught my attention um, a few days ago with a story of even something as harmless sounding as what if we had an AI powered, the greatest teacher that has ever existed in human history. Wouldn't that just be an unmitigated, wonderful thing? Retell a bit of that story, if you would, and illustrate why, yes, it is something to be sought after, um, but something also we'd have to be really careful about. Sure, and th this is something that I've been thinking about for a few years just as a sort of thought experiment. Um, you know, obviously, um, AIs are starting to develop sort of personalities, and we're starting to relate to them in increasingly intimate ways. Um, kids, in particular, are really kind of latch on to technology. I have an 11-month-old daughter at home, and when uh, Alexa says, your iPhone is now connected, she just starts dancing in her high chair because she knows that the music is about to start. <laughs> um, but one of the things I've been thinking about is that you know, it, it will be possible soon to deploy artificial intelligence teachers um, for children, adults, anybody, um, that will be infinitely patient, that will have all the world's information at their fingertips, um, and that can actually get better over time at delivering this information um, to the student that will be more and more compelling, that will find ways to make them want to learn. And um, this might be something that appears first as just a sort of uh, entertainment uh, option where, you know, let your kids learn about geography. It's not intended to replace school, but suddenly your kids are completely immersed in this. Um, and maybe it's a freemium model. Maybe, you know, there are no ads and um, who's creating that content? Or on the other hand, maybe there are ads and they're just woven in. So the teacher is gently suggesting that the student might want to do this or that, you know, purchase this or that product um, to make their lives better. And as, as we become more and more intimately entwined with AIs, um, I think they're going to have extraordinary persuasive power uh, over us. And, and that's something that we need to be careful about, particularly when it comes to kids. I mean, we're already, as adults, struggling with, with this. But I think with kids, um, it's going to be much more challenging. But also, 
highly compelling. And that's where the dilemma is, is that you know, in this vision, any <coughs> kid with a smartphone anywhere in the world might be able to effectively learn uh, the things that they need for, for the coming future. And yet, um, what, what sort of um, you know, agenda is going to be delivered along with that information? The training data, where does it come from? <laughs> and what does it reinforce, right? Great, um, Kyung Al, I wanna come back to you. Um, you know, one of the, one of the major um, vectors or the dimensions in the scenarios we talked about were the, these um, opposing forces or the two forces of decentralization and centralization. And one of the things that we think about when we hear about that is a number of the things that we're working on. So in the current moment, particularly with technology-led businesses, it's a little hard, there's more talk about you know, winner takes all, you know, super returns, and, the, and people have talked about the fact that technology seems to be concentrating more than the opposite. On the other hand, you work on some, some financing instruments and some of the things that would need to be in place to enable a more distributed model. Say a little bit about that. You know, what are, what are some of the things in the world of finance that might have the opposite effect? Sure, and, and look, I'm not sure it's an either or by any means, and you kind of, painted that picture of the different spectrums. Um, and I think technology is actually enabling uh, much more of a decentralized, decommoditized, and empowering consumer model in many industries. And one of the industries where we're seeing the fastest shift in this is actually in the energy sector, right? So if you think about our energy model, particularly the electric utility model, it's gone from what used to be very much a centralized, commoditized, fossil-based energy, and it's rapidly becoming decentralized, diversified, and cleaner. And it's also empowering consumers to make smarter, more efficient choices, leveraging good data, as well as um, you know, the actual power of the, the smartphones. Um, and the question around financing comes up around, how do you actually help finance some of these transitions? Because gross generalization, but capital tends to flow towards where there's optimal risk return. And generally, they tend to be transactions uh, that are larger in scale. Uh, for proven technology, as well as in more stable developed markets, and where transaction costs are small, and therefore they don't tend to go towards decentralized type opportunity sets. Um, but there's a lot happening that has changed that dynamic, and I'm not gonna you know, go through too much of the financial structuring components of it, but let me give you very, three very broad examples. One is a structuring uh, example where there's something called securitization, where you can aggregate smaller types of assets, you can pull them into bigger bonds and different financing instruments. You can place it into that very deep liquid public capital market that we talked about earlier. And we happened to do the very first solar securitization in the world in Japan in 2013, as a country was looking to diversify into renewable energy post Fukushima. Um, and on the heels of that, many more securitizations have been done, certainly here in the US for rooftop solar, but also in emerging markets like China, and importantly, in places like even like Kenya. And Kenya is small, but it's incredibly exciting because it's, it happens to be for something called off-grid solar. And coming to off-grid solar, a second example of what's happening uh, in this space is, technology is now enabling financing to be able to access the 1.2 billion people in the world who don't have access to energy and won't have any grid access anytime soon. Uh, and um, many of these actual people do have access to phones, however, um, and therefore there are off-grid solar developers who are now uh, doing what is called pay-as-you-go financing, so effectively enabling access to solar lanterns and home solar systems through their phone, either through installments or um, as they actually access the solar power itself and therefore de-risking it from a credit perspective and enabling more financial flows to these very marginalized people. Right? So that's another example. I think a third example, which is also quite exciting in early days, is crowdfunding. Um, and you're seeing individuals who may only have $100 or $1,000 here and there who want to actually invest in solar and other just decentralized opportunity sets, but can't access it because it's relatively small magnitudes of investment through crowdfunding now being able to invest into solar projects and exciting, excitingly also solar opportunities in their communities. So the power of technology, of financing, and decentralization, I think, is coming together very much so, early days. Uh, but I'm very excited about that, and um, I think it's going to apply across many different industries. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Jacob, I want to come to you now. One of the things that you're fond of saying, 
pretty much every day that I see you, is that uh, scenarios are neither predictions nor forecasts. Mm -hmm. Why is that a good thing, and why should we be relying more on scenarios than predictions and forecasts? Actually, I wouldn't say that we should rely on them more. I would say that business relies very heavily on forecasts and that there are blind spots in forecasts that, that are, are a risk uh, if you do that. Um, forecasts um, you know, extrapolate data from the past using current trend information. Um, there are things that don't yet exist in a forecast um, that are going to disrupt the future that simply cannot be captured in that model. I was talking to somebody from the auto industry um, just a couple of weeks ago, and I said, 10 years ago, did you think that um, Google, Apple, Tesla would be competitors of yours? And she said, absolutely not. You know, we were doing forecasts on demand in China. Um, so I'm not saying don't do forecasting. It's very useful, particularly for near-term um, futures. Once in a while, though, it's important to stop, take a look around, and try to ascertain what are these things that might be emerging that aren't even in your models, that you can't put a number to, but are going to be incredibly important for you to consider? So one of the, one of the signs of the, the rise of this approach or greater attention being paid to it are, are the, the um, recommendations that you mentioned from the task force on finance, uh, climate-related financial disclosure. I always yes. get this messed up, TCFD. <laughs> um, to what, and I'd love, to love you both to answer this from different perspectives. Is this, is this the sign of things to come? Are we about to see a, a much bigger injection? I, Kate, I remember we spoke some months ago, and I think you had gotten the, you had read the recommendations, and the CDP uh, survey for the year cycle came. It was like, wow, we got to do scenarios? Are we not, we, this, is, this is new. Is this flash in the pan? Is this the beginning of something that we think is going to go further? And what are you guys doing about it? I guess would be the other part of the question. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I love the report, and I and I generally think this kind of thinking is becoming increasingly important. And and I do think it's been really interesting and really useful to see how the TCFD has really popularizing scenario analysis. And of course, I'm sure many people in this room complete CDP reports. My colleague Laura, who does ours, is sitting right here. Um, you know, and, and I, I think it's great, and it, we, we were already doing some of that work before the TCFD came out, but I think it's incredibly useful. You know, we were able to look across our global operations and say, you know, in a two degree C future, what are the impacts going to look like? In a business as usual future from today, what are the impacts going to look like? And how do we use that to think about where we locate new facilities? How do we use that to think about what kind of investments we want to make today? Um, so I think it's incredibly valuable, and I think it's here to stay, absolutely. How about from your perspective, finance, broader use, is this new or is this old hat to you guys? You're just seeing more people use it. I mean, scenario analysis is something that we um, quite frequently use in the context of modeling and looking at upside scenarios, downside scenarios, base case scenarios, so it's very familiar territory. Um, and I think generally scenarios have a very useful purpose, particularly in this world that we live in where, just to borrow the word from Silicon Valley, change is never going to be as slow as it is today. It's incredibly dynamic. And you talked about some of the different players. Uh, I think more and more people use a word of co-opetition, right. right? You cooperate, but you compete. The new entrants that you never anticipated and people are now becoming much more of a partnership model, but also competing at the same time. So the world is dramatically changing, and therefore it does have a purpose. But I'm also very candid and very careful uh, in that um, one of the biggest challenges that I'm seeing in ESG is disclosure for the sake of disclosure, right? There's a prolifer proliferation of information. Um, and also, there's lots of different ESG ratings companies. In fact, one of our research analysts that does ESG data looked at the raters, and there's over 100 of them. And I'm sure many of you have read the Wall Street Journal article a month or two ago where they asked the question of, is Tesla or is it, was it ExxonMobil uh, more sustainable? And depending on the ESG ratings firm, the answer is either, right? It's variable, right? So that, that's sort of part of the challenge here in that the goal of TCFD to ensure that we have more consistent and better climate risk disclosure and opportunity disclosure is absolutely something that I think is, is valuable. 
But where I put the emphasis is really on it has to be material, it has to be decision useful, and if the scenario supports that goal, then yes. But scenario analysis for the sake of scenario analysis is not something that I would say I encourage. It has to be decision useful and material. I think we would give a big amen to that. That's great. <laughs> um, fantastic. So Jacob, maybe um, with we've got a few minutes left, um, I think it would be great to paint a little bit of a picture, and others can comment also, of what are, what are we intending to do. Maybe let's start with the rest of this week. We, you know, the, this session and the way we've done it is intentionally a provocation. We'll see if, if we're rewarded for it or not. We've done a session about a report that none of you have read, um, <laughs> which is great. Um, we, if, if this works, you're all gonna run back to your rooms and dial it right up, and then we're gonna be talking about it. It's not really huge. It is thought-provoking, but it's not thick. And we've got a couple sessions that are gonna provide an opportunity for a deep dive. Jacob, maybe you wanna mention at least one of them that you're doing and sure. a few other things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock, I'll be running an interactive workshop. Um, I think the title is Using Scenarios to Create Resilient Business Strategy. And it's going to be um, just a highly interactive session to really to take a couple of these scenarios and give people a taste of what the actual process is to test strategy against scenarios and then to modify it to be resilient across a set of, of more than one possible futures. Um, so I would encourage you all to come to that, or as many of you as are interested, not all of you, um, but <laughs> up to 100 of you uh, to come to that uh, who are interested. Um, I'll be doing a session tomorrow morning also uh, 9 a.m. on the future of retail. Uh, there'll also be an interactive futures component there. Uh, we have a session that Peter Michael is leading on 21st, biz 21st century business strategy uh, that talks about some of these approaches um, my colleague Tara is leading a session on blockchain, which obviously the future is gonna have blockchain in it. Um, so th those are a few places that I would say spring to mind to, to dip in, but honestly, so much of the program is relevant to the themes that are in these scenarios that, I mean, those are some highlights that occur to me, but I think um, the, the issues discussed in the scenarios are, are really woven through a lot of these sessions. Terrific, thank you. And, and um, I'll, I'll finish this off by just a, a real invitation to engage with us on this content. Um, as Jacob mentioned in his overview, there's two things that we think about, or at least two things. Um, one is creating the sort of content that you will go back to your room and read later tonight, um, and specialized sessions you might do with your team. It's, you know, futures is one of those topics. It's not hard to have a really awesome half-day meeting and get people there's head spinning and thinking differently about the future. What's a lot harder is following that up with insight that can then translate in a useful way to what you do. We're really um, not gonna be satisfied until we help you figure out both of those. And, and we've got both of those things that, that we can discuss in terms of how to get a team in a room, get them thinking about um, the future and possibilities of things very differently. And then others that Jacob mentioned, which is in a in a less grand way, how do you take that same trends analysis and some of these other tools and put it into an activity that, that, to improve the quality of it and you're doing it anyway? So if probably the materiality areas, the, the, the uh, assessments are the place where we have most experience with it. And it's really quite simple. Materiality as we've tended to do it is a picture of what the world looks like today. Basically, we're taking trends analysis to stress test it, what if? How stable is this thing we've just created? And if we wanted to highlight three or four or five things that might be really fast movers based on what you think is gonna happen, what are those? So those are just a couple of examples. Uh, really welcome the engagement on it. I think, I'm looking at the comms team, I think we're even gonna have an opportunity when you feed back on this conference, if you've read the scenarios to, to tell us what you think. If you don't get a chance to do that, uh, Jacob loves direct feedback, so um, we'll do it that way. So with that, uh, please join me in thanking uh, the panel and Jacob for a great session. You guys can go ahead. Thank you so much. <laughs>